right, good evening. The time is now six o'clock and I'd like to welcome everybody to the city council meeting for the city of Galt for Tuesday, May the 18th. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic emergency, we have to conduct, we have to continue to handle our city council meetings much differently than we usually do for the protection of the public and our city staff. I'm now going to ask our substitute city manager, Mr. Selling to give a brief explanation to the public. Mike. Thank you, Mayor Farmer. And good evening, everyone. I'll be standing in for the city manager tonight as Mayor Farmer just noted. Uh, otherwise, Public Works is where I'm at. Um, and uh, so this meeting uh, of the Galt City Council is being conducted by teleconference, video conference, in compliance with the state and county uh, stay at home orders. And as allowed by the governor's executive order N-29-20 which allows for a deviation of teleconference rules required under the Brown Act. Members of the public will see and or hear the council members and city staff who are appearing via remote video telephone connections. City council meetings are being held virtually by teleconference or video conference only until further notice. Today's agenda states that rather than attending in person, residents may submit written public comments via email to pubcom at cityofgalt.org prior to the council meeting. Any written comments that were received will be read out loud during the council meeting by the city clerk for the appropriate agenda item on the appropriate agenda item, subject to the customary five minute time limit, unless the same individual also appears and requests to speak live during the meeting. We will take the live comments first and then the written comments will be read out loud. We are also using the Zoom webinar format, which allows the public to provide live public comment. Members of the public may use the link to enter the webinar as attendees. They should be able to use the raise your hand feature uh, or option in the Zoom webinar to let us know if they would like to speak and should do so when the mayor announces the time for the general public comment or when a specific agenda item is called if your comment concerns an item on the agenda. We request, as we do at typical in-person council meetings, that speakers provide their name and address when they are called on to speak and their line is unmuted, though doing so is not required. Attendees should also see a lower hand feature if they change their mind and do not want to speak. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, sir. All right, we'll now call the meeting to order. Ms. Hubert, if you can give me a roll call, please. Vice Mayor Sandu. Here. Council Member Papineau. Here. Council Member Vandenberg. Here. Council Member Lozano. Here. Mayor Farmer. Here. All right, if I would ask everybody now to join us in a silent prayer, followed by our flag salute. All right, if you would all please join me in a flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Ms. Hubert, if you would please give our replay statement. This meeting of the Galt City Council will be cablecast on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on the Comcast Consolidated Communications and AT&T UVerse cable systems. The meeting is closed captioned and webcast at www.sacmetrocable.tv. Today's meeting will air Friday, May 21st at 9 a.m. and Saturday, May 22nd at 9 a.m. This meeting can also be viewed on Metro Cable 14's YouTube channel. All right, thank you. We'll now move on to item B, agenda approval, additions and or deletions. Do I have anything from council? I actually would like to pull F4 from the consent. All 
All right, we don't have anything further. We'll move on to item C, presentations. Subject tonight is gonna to be our Sacramento Yellow Mosquito and Vector Control District Annual Report to the City Council. All right, we have Gary Goodman. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and allow him to um, give the presentation. Good evening, Mr. Goodman. There we go. All right, there we go. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. I'll assume uh, by smiles or nodding of heads that you can. All right. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to, to come out and talk with uh, uh, the city of Galt about uh, what we're anticipating for mosquito and vector control this upcoming season. So uh, my name is Gary Goodman. I'm the district manager for uh, mosquito uh, for the Sacramento Yolo Mosquito Vector Control. And we cover all of Sacramento and Yolo County. And of course, we work very closely uh, with San Joaquin County, just to the south of you, uh, on mosquito control issues as we are associated. Um, I also want to recognize, and I think she's going to want to say something uh, a little bit later, Marcia Mooney is the GALT representative that sits on our district board. Uh, she's been there for a couple of years now. Um, we're very excited to have her. She brings a, a wealth of experience and knowledge and very active in terms of uh, vector control um, uh, uh, um, for the district as a whole. Uh, next slide, please. So our goal at the district is, is obviously to protect public health. We're a public health agency, and, and specifically, we look at um, uh, virus activity uh, that are transmitted by mosquitoes. And so, but also it's a matter of annoyance or abundance uh, issues associated with mosquitoes as well. And so we want to make sure that when people are out, especially in the summertime, uh, they're out in their backyard, they're taking a walk in the park, that uh, they're not being bothered by mosquitoes to the point where it's a complete annoyance and can be an economic issue. Uh, but the majority of our work is actually spent on being able to try to identify and treat um, for mosquitoes that are carrying disease, specifically West Nile virus. Uh, next slide, please. So we do this by, uh, we have folks that are out in the field uh, every day, um, and essentially they're looking for these types of mosquito breeding sources. And so mosquitoes need water to breed. That's, uh, that's where they lay their eggs. That's where they, they go through their metamor metamorphosis in terms of larval stage and pupil stage, and then emerge as adults. And so lots of different sources that we have to try to look for. And there's some things that are very easy for us to find, like the, uh, the rice fields or wetlands, um, any open area that has a water vegetation interface. Um, and of course, even green swimming pools that are not being maintained are great producers of mosquitoes. Uh, the harder things for us to find are the things that are in folks' backyard. Um, the sprinklers go off, they fill up that bucket, they fill up that, um, that uh, potted plant with the saucer underneath. Um, all of those things that hold water for more than about seven days are potential mosquito breeding sources. And so we really rely on the public to be able to try to help us identify where there are problems, um, specifically within their neighborhood, if they're being bothered by mosquitoes, so that we can come out and take a look and hopefully find some of these sources that are in folks' backyards. Uh, the other thing we ask the public to do is just to try to look around their yard and make sure that they're draining any standing water like these types of sources about once a week. Uh, make sure that you're not producing mosquitoes on your own property. Next slide, please. So we go through what we call an integrated mosquito management approach, and it's kind of five components. The first one, public information. And, and obviously in the year of COVID, it was very difficult for us to go out and do public events. Uh, they weren't being held. So we had a very active uh, school program where we made presentations to, to schools. We would go out to fairs and events, neighborhood associations, all of those types of things to be able to try to spread uh, our message in terms of how to prevent mosquitoes and West Nile virus. Uh, we tried to do more aspects of online and actually the Galt, Galt uh, City, uh, you guys are very helpful in terms of posting information on your website or in your newsletters, um, just trying to help us disseminate the information when we had um, issues associated with vector control. But we also have a very active uh, advertising program, um, radio and television, making sure that the public knows who we are, what we do, and, and what they can try to do to help prevent uh, mosquito breeding and West Nile virus transmission. Uh, then we have what we call our surveillance program, and this is for us uh, setting traps throughout the district. Um, we are looking at different types and species of mosquitoes. In our area, we have about 24 different species of mosquitoes. Not all of them transmit disease. Um, they're, they're all endemic to this area, and so we want to try to check and make sure what are the abundance of mosquitoes. Are the mosquitoes increasing, decreasing? And of course, our surveillance tells us where and when uh, we have West Nile virus activity in the mosquito population. Then we have our biological control program. The picture right there in the middle is mosquito fish. These are gambusia. We, uh, we plant these in various sources from um, unmaintained swimming pools to wetlands 
uh, rice fields, irrigation ditches, water troughs, wherever they may help us uh, combat the mosquito larvae that is in, uh, in a particular source. And we do this free of charge. In our district, uh, we plant about 3,500 to 4,000 pounds of fish per year. Uh, we're probably the largest mosquito fish breeding facility in the country. I'm very proud of that particular program. Uh, then we have an ecological management program uh, that's geared towards working with landowners and specifically large landowners, farmers, um, wetland owners, um, uh, CRP, Consumers River Preserve is one that we're very active with, and being able to try to give them ideas and tips on how to reduce mosquito breeding on their yard, whether it be clearing out of ditches or we even have a backhoe and dump truck to be able to try to provide services in kind. So we work with those folks uh, to be able to make sure that those large landowners are not producing mosquitoes that are having impact on the neighborhood as a whole. Uh, and then the last aspect is uh, what we call chemical control. And that's, for, again, for us looking at those mosquito breeding sources, uh, treating with an appropriate larvicide in the water when we find them. Uh, but then when we do have adult mosquitoes um, and we get numbers, high numbers and or what virus activity is when we will start to do um, adult mosquito control, which can be anywhere from a backpack to, uh, to a truck mounted or ATV, uh, even up to an airplane. And we do a lot of airplane work, mostly in our rural areas, our agricultural type of areas but we have been known to do airplanes uh, up over town. Uh, haven't had to do that for golf because typically you guys find, don't find a lot of West Nile virus uh, in your area. Next slide, please. So uh, as an example, this is West Nile virus activity in California for the last few years. And uh, the last three years, we've had pretty mild um, situation in terms of the number of mosquitoes that have tested positive for the virus. And of course, the number of human cases, which, are, which is our largest metric. Um, but one thing I do want to try to highlight is that um, when it comes to human cases, these are reported cases. So these are typically cases that they've been diagnosed and tested by the doctor. Um, and then all of these cases are, are, are mandatory reporting to the public health officer. And so typically what happens is that the cases that get reported are actually the more serious neuroinvasive form of the disease that can lead to uh, paralysis, blindness, and of course, even death. Um, so, but for every serious form or neuroinvasive form of the disease, CDC estimates that there's anywhere from 30 to 70 cases that go unreported. Um, a lot of people actually get sick from West Nile virus, but they just stay home, they have a bad flu, uh, they recover, uh, and, then, and then they never ever actually get tested. And so we think the number of cases are actually significantly underreported. Um, one thing we want to try to highlight here is the fact that West Nile can and is a very serious disease. Uh, there was a study that was done um, about 10 years ago by California Department of Public Health, where they interviewed uh, folks that had been stricken with West Nile, had symptoms of West Nile, and talked to them a year later. And almost 50% of the folks that had symptoms were still experiencing some level of symptom a year later. So uh, we want to make sure that people understand this is a very serious disease that can lead to death, but there's very simple things that they can do to try to help prevent that. Next slide, please. So here's an outline of, of the city of Galt uh, and the West Nile virus activity that we've had in, in your particular area last year. Um, so we had about six uh, West Nile virus positive mosquito samples. And so these are collections of mosquitoes that we tested and found positive for West Nile. The yellow triangles are positive dead birds that we found. Um, so uh, this is very good. Galt tends not to have a whole lot of West Nile. Uh, we do tend to have a little bit of a problem um, on that southern border, that Dead Man's Gulch area that is a, a large mosquito producer for us. Um, but in terms of West Nile virus activity, uh, we tend not to have a whole lot in the city of Galt, so, which is a good thing and hopefully we'll be able to keep that up this year. Uh, next slide, please. So one uh, new concern that we're finding, as I mentioned, we have about 24 different species of mosquitoes um, that are endemic to our area. We are starting to detect and find what we call invasive mosquitoes. These are mosquitoes that are not supposed to be in our area, but have found their way here. Um, and typically, or for, for instance, the specific one that we're concerned about is called Aedes aegypti. It's a yellow fever mosquito, originated from Southeast Asia and then made its way over to the Americas, as well established in more tropical areas like uh, Brazil, South America, Mexico, um, and has now started to make its way up and uh, become established in, in California. And the concern with this particular mosquito is one, it definitely likes to bite humans and likes to be around people, um, but that it can also be a vector of the more exotic diseases such as dengue, Zika, or chikungunya. And so uh, we do not want this mosquito to get established in our area. Uh, we have detected it. Um, however, unfortunately, in areas like Citrus Heights and Arden, Arden Arcade in Sacramento County, um, and we're constantly on the lookout for this. And so this is another opportunity for the public 
um, that we ask the public, if you're being bothered by mosquitoes, give us a call, let us know so that we can come out um, and identify and make sure that they're not this type of invasive species of mosquito. Next slide, please. So as an example, this is a map of areas where we've detected um, this particular invasive. Um, you can see the Arden Arcade area just north of the river in Sacramento County. Citrus Heights was a, a detection that we found in 2019. Um, but even in remote areas like Winters, um, a very small community um, uh, that, uh, that the mosquito can actually get established. And the challenge with this one is the fact that these mosquitoes don't fly there. Um, they're not very good flyers. In fact, they only move about 150 meters. Um, so they kind of stay relatively local. Essentially, these are mosquitoes that are being brought by people. Um, and so um, that's where we, that's where the biggest challenge is, is that these are not ones that just kind of migrate into a particular area. They're actually brought by folks and then become established. And so we want people to be on the lookout for uh, what we call day biting mosquitoes. So if you're out and about and you, you're being bitten in the middle of the day, um, give us a call so we can come out and take a look at it. Uh, next slide, please. So again, these are sources that we found over the last couple of years that are in people's backyards. And this is where the challenge is. Again, it's easy for us to see a rice field or a wetland, um, but very difficult for us to see what's in people's backyards. And obviously we don't have the resources to be able to try to go into everyone's backyard. So we really ask the public's help. Are you being bothered by mosquitoes? Do you have these types of sources? All of these photos were taken from sources or, or uh, home, homes where we found this type of mosquito. And so I want to do try to highlight the, um, the picture on the very bottom middle there. Um, that's a plant called a bromeliad that holds just a little bit of water. And this mosquito can actually breed in just a tablespoon of water. So it doesn't need that much. And that's where we need to be able to try to get the public's help in identifying um, these sources and having them drain um, any of these types of standing water sources in their own backyard. Next slide, please. So we are looking at what we're calling innovative control strategies. And so, um, uh, and specifically what we call sterile insect technique. And uh, this technique has been used um, for, the, for decades, um, specifically by USDA um, to help control screwworm. Um, it's been used um, by uh, um, California Department of Food and Ag for medfly control. Um, and now they're starting to get some researchers that are really looking at this type of control strategy for mosquitoes. Um, and so there's a couple of different groups um, that we've been uh, collaborating with and being able to try to figure out, could you use sterile insect technique for mosquitoes? And the concept here is that mosquitoes, uh, only female mosquitoes bite. They're looking for the protein in your blood to be able to try to produce the eggs. Male mosquitoes don't bite. Uh, they just feed on nectar and fly around and mate. Um, and so the concept here is that you would sterilize um, male mosquitoes um, and then you would release those mosquitoes into a, an environment and then they would mate with the female, the wild females, and then the progeny would be no good. Um, so the concept works very well. It just hasn't been established for mosquitoes as of yet. Uh, they are doing, a, a, there have been some trials that have been done specifically in Fresno in Southern California. Um, they're currently doing um, work in the Florida Keys uh, with this. They've done some stuff in Texas um, and then some in Caribbean islands and even in places in South America. And so it's very promising uh, research and very promising control strategy that essentially would eliminate uh, or, or minimize the use of pesticides that we would have to do. We would be able to try to control the species uh, specifically by releasing uh, sterilized males. So it's an exciting prospect for us. Next slide, please. So for us, um, we're going to continue to monitor both for uh, surveillance for West Nile virus, um, informing the public of where and when we have that, um, continue to try to look at other methods such as the sterile insect technique, um, always looking for uh, outreach opportunities. Um, and we appreciate, um, obviously, when, when things start to open, thing, open back up and we start to do events in the evening, especially in the summertime, um, please let us know. Uh, we, have, uh, we hand out repellent packets, um, and so we can deliver repellent packets uh, to any outdoor event uh, that you're having so that people can use that and make sure that they're uh, protecting themselves um, from mosquitoes and mosquito biting. Um, and for the most part, what we really want to try to communicate to the public is one, make sure you're not producing pro uh, mosquitoes on your own property, uh, drain any standing water, make sure you're, you're, if you're out during mosquito activity that you're wearing a good repellent. And if you see mosquitoes or being bothered by mosquitoes in your neighborhood, just give us a call. We typically come out within 24 hours um, and to make sure that, uh, that we, and we can let you know exactly where they may be coming from, the type of, that are there, and then do testing to make sure that they're not carrying virus activity. Uh, next slide, please. 
So with that, um, you can get more information at our website, which is uh, fightthebite.net. Uh, um, you can give us a call at our toll-free number. Um, and with that, I'll answer any questions that the council may have. Thank you, Mr. Goodman. Um, I have a couple questions and then I'll see if the council has any. Um, so it, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but the standing, like standing pool water, I, I mean, I'm not sure if that's gonna be like a bigger problem this year because of COVID, uh, maybe people are just not maintaining their yards and things, I, I, I don't know. But um, I know that's usually the biggest, one of the biggest problems is people that don't take care of pools. Is it, so if they, people shouldn't be afraid if they have a pool and they've neglected it. I mean, they shouldn't feel guilty about contacting you guys. You guys will come over and plant the type of fish you mentioned and stuff. That's a free charge. You're not gonna, they're not gonna get like cited or something, right? Or no. Not, not at all. Absolutely. We, we want to know about it. Um, we've, we've had, uh, we have an active uh, swimming pool program is what we call it. Uh, we want the outreach and we need the public's help to be able to try to identify it. Even if it's a neighbor, we do things anonymously. Uh, we don't care whether it's green or not. We just want to make sure that it's not producing mosquitoes. And so, yeah, there's no citation. Um, our services are free of charge. Um, we, we want to come out and make sure that we're trying to protect public health and we need the public's help in doing that. So absolutely. Uh, we'll plant the fish. Um, we'll give you as many tools and um, information about how to prevent uh, future mosquito breeding on your property. Um, but really, um, there, nobody should have any fear in contacting us. We want we will come out again. We're usually out within 24 hours and all of the services that we provide are free of charge. OK, that's good to know. I, I think there's a there's a myth there and people are afraid to call sometimes. I know I have a close friend who um, she contracted West Nile, I believe it was about 10 years ago for a call and it, it, it was, it crippled her. I mean, she's, she's disabled now. Um, it, it was like the first time I'd ever known anybody and uh, it's, it's no joke. It's very serious, like you said. And um, so um, I'm assuming that, um, so fightthebite.com uh, fight is the uh, website with all the information, phone numbers, all that? Yes, absolutely. Fightthebite.net. Uh, uh, .com's apparently somebody beat us to it, so. Okay. Fightthebite.net. And then um, I'm assuming that our social, our city will do its part in getting this information on our social media pages and all of that as we move into the season. So um, does any of the council have any um, questions for Mr. Goodman? Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Vice Mayor, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I have just uh, the information. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Mr. Goodman. Give us uh, that detailed information and outreach to the public. Uh, my question is uh, just only the information, West Nile virus activity in Galt. And I'm looking at the map, there is five uh, red dot and one yellow dot. So can you maybe a little bit explain to these means how you pull the sample, these are active, positive, or could you might you explain me a little bit uh, about that? Yeah. So. So we have we have traps located throughout our district and specifically uh, in the city of Galt. Um, and sometimes those traps are um, that we, we keep at the same location so we can monitor populations throughout uh, throughout the year, make sure that there are they increasing or decreasing. Um, and then when we find or when we, we have a suspicion of potential virus activity, we have different, I'll say different kinds of traps, but we trap mosquitoes, we bring those mosquitoes back to our facility. Um, we separate them by um, species um, and, and even and, and by sex. Uh, so separate the males from the females because females are going to be the ones that are carrying the virus because um, West Nile virus is a bird disease. So it is carried by birds. A mosquito bites a bird that is infected with West Nile. It picks it up and then it bites another bird and passes it on or it bites a human um, and then transmits the disease that way. And so we trap mosquitoes essentially almost year round. We test for mosquitoes. The virus activity season starts now at about May and goes through October. So when the weather starts to cool off, uh, you tend not to see any virus activity um, per se. Uh, and so we test from May through October. Uh, we bring those mosquitoes back to our facility. We separate them out and then we have a PCR machine. Um, we, so we have a biologist that specifically, microbiologist that specifically does that testing uh, on PCR. Um, and so essentially they're picking up um, uh, the virus in those mosquitoes. And then when we get a positive, um, then we typically notify, we, we'll do like a press release. We'll put information on our website. Uh, we'll try to reach out to the, um, to the individual city or area that it is so that people are aware that there's virus activity in that particular area. 
And then we'll start to do um, what we call, uh, you know, upgraded control measures. So more intensive look in and around to try to figure out what's scope, how much virus activity do we have here? Um, you know, how much potential transmission is there? Um, and doing as many mitigating factors as we can to try to help keep those mosquito levels low and keep that virus, um, that virus level low. So um, that, that's kind of our process. We'll continue to do that. Uh, once we find something, we do a lot more trapping in that particular area. So if I were to find something at a particular yard, then we would go out and set multiple traps um, within about a mile radius of that, uh, of that particular location to see what, it, what is the extent of the virus um, that's happening in that area. Well, thank you, Mr. Goodman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sandu. Any uh, other questions from other council members? Okay. Well, with that- Here, I'd like to just say that we have uh, Marsha Mooney. She's a representative from the um, Yolo Mosquito and Vector Control on yes, the line too, if she wanted to say a couple words. Yeah, I was gonna acknowledge that I didn't uh, Do you have anything to add, Ms. Mooney? Well, I just wanted to say hello. I, I, uh, you all reappointed me in December to the to the district um, board, and I do appreciate it. I haven't met all of you yet, and hopefully one of these days we will be able to do this in person. But I've been on the board for a year and a half now, and I will tell you that it is very well set up. The district runs really well. I mean, I'm not saying this because I'm there, but it was that way before I got there, and continues to be that way with with our great district manager. So. Just wanted to say hello, and I'm available if you ever need me, and um, thank you. All right. Thank you, and thank you for representing us. We appreciate that. Glad to All right. you. Well, thank you, Ms. Mooney. Thank you, Mr. Goodman. And for those of you watching one more time, uh, www.fightthebite.net for any information on any of this that we just had. So Perfect. have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we need to take public comment on this, Tina, or no? or ask for a public comment. Um, yes, you okay. should take a couple of comments on this. Um, do we have any written public comment on this item, Ms. Hubert? We do not. All right, and we have any hands raised online, Rose? We do not have any hands raised. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll move on to item D, which is our public comment. Tina? Under government code section 54954.3, members of the public may address the city council on non-agenda items. The public comment section is for the city council to receive comments, except for brief responses to questions, no discussion or action may be taken on any item that is not listed on the agenda. Please limit comments to a maximum of five minutes. Due to the statewide emergency and social distancing guidelines, Public comments may be submitted via email to pubcom at cityofgalt.org and will be read out loud subject to the customary five minute time limitation. Also members of the public may participate electronically via https colon forward slash forward slash us02 web.zoom.us forward slash j forward slash 839-03-401549, webinar ID 839-03-401549. And we do have uh, written comments. Okay, go ahead. So the first one is from um, Tara Wilson. We are hoping that we can use some of the land for a license. This is on the Galt Market Plan. We are hoping that we can use some of the land for a licensed vocational nursing program. This vocation facility center could house additional career options. This will help create more jobs for the community, such as welding, highway construction, mass transit construction, windmill construction, solar construction, and installations, electric battery operated car construction, et cetera. A task force would be needed to see if viable. People would really need to be voted, motivated to bring and or relocate a vocational school to Galt. It would have to be a facility that would be flexible enough to grow with new upcoming industries. Not only would it bring student and faculty to Galt from elsewhere, but it would also benefit businesses such as local grocery stores, restaurants, retail, and it would help create the demand for the Galt market. It could provide a workforce for all of Galt's businesses. Hopefully this vocational school 
should allow some type of college credit to further some students' education. Could there be a bocce ball shuffleboard courts in the Galt market plan? Example, one court could be for novices and one court could be for team playing. It could be near the Galt market senior living area. It would be more for the non-athletic type people. Some parking could be placed on the rooftops of multiple buildings. The parking spots could have solar panels above the spaces. This could also provide shade. Another idea is to have one rooftop restaurant or coffee shop with a view. Thank you for your consideration. The Thank next you. one is from Chelsea Height. Um, all trash from flea market. It also gets in my pool. I have already replaced pool motor. Next one is you are responsible for because the trash is in my pool, my yard. It is nasty and a liability. I would like you to take responsible for thank you. This one is from, it's one email from three people, Dolce Selkie, Dudley Cox and Jennifer Michelson. This email is to address the ongoing problem with weekly garbage surrounding the flea market. It is all over the streets and we as residents have to constantly pick it up. It gets into our backyards on windy days. The plastic bags get stuck in the trees and also the power lines making the area look trashy, trashy looking. I'm hoping this can be resolved. It is great to have a flea market, but the trash is unacceptable. Possible to have a flea market on a weekend once a month so others can take part. Please make it public of how the issue will be resolved. The next one is from Tiffany Hawkins. We need to put better signs and flashing sign to slow drivers down around the park. We don't need to kill someone to make a change. Please do something now to help the kids and adults feel safe. And that is all I have. Okay, thank you. I uh, appreciate all the input. Um, Mr. Sonia, I don't know if you could maybe um, pass that on to um, Mr. Hines about the trash and having work with Armando. I know we have a uh, some you know efforts in place already i don't know if we can bring those concerns there and see what more could be done um and uh yeah and for all the other comments we appreciate the public comment thank you yes i, I made some notes so i will definitely pass it on thanks mayor and i believe the comment about the park is referenced to metaview park because i got an email about that it's regarding the uh baseball games that take place there on a saturday so the concern is cost road. So just for some, I'm sure that's what she was mentioning because I recognize her name. So um, if, is there any comment from council before we move on? Okay. All right, we will move on. Is there any hands raised online, Rose? There are no hazard, hands raised online. All right, we'll move on to item E, reports by city council members on regional boards commissions and committees. We will start with our vice mayor, Mr. Sandu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I attended STA uh, meeting on May uh, 13. Uh, there was a couple things uh, I, will, I would like to mention to the council. Uh, this meeting uh, introduced a draft STA budget for fiscal year 21-22 but they just did the introduce and then continue to next board meeting. I certainly bring back apples, certainly anything belong to the court. Uh, the other thing uh, we uh, approved the release of request for possible public outreach uh, for the firm because possible sale tax measure in 2022 has not yet been developed yet, uh, but we did approve a around $28,000 for four months for outreach to the public. Then we will see as a board or as staff if there is enough support from the public. And the third thing I would like to report, uh, the June meeting uh, on June 10 changed to June 17 uh, due to the conflict of uh, county supervisor uh, budget hearing. And that's about it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Council Member Papineau. I don't have anything to report. All right, thank you, sir. Council Member Vandenberg. I do not have anything to report at this time either. 
All right, thank you. Councilman Lozano. Yeah, um, I attended a policy and innovation committee meeting for um, SACOG on the 10th. And um, we uh, looked over the budget and operational wor working program uh, or the overall working program for, for the next year and, and uh, unanimously uh, recommended the full board uh, approve it. Um, we talked about the telework project and the pilot program that's going on with that. Um, the, again, just as a additional information or a refresher, this is a program to take a look at telework uh, regionally to see uh, the effects uh, it will have on uh, vehicle miles traveled in the region. Um, certainly uh, the issue of how it affects the economy is, is on the top of everyone's mind as well. And so we're gonna keep moving that forward. Um, and uh, then there was just an advocacy update about uh, new, new, not new laws, but uh, kind of pushing forward again, Green Means Go program, uh, both at the state and federal level. And so uh, more to come on that as, as the uh, session continues. So uh, that's all I have. And uh, we have a SACOG meeting, uh, board, full board meeting coming up this Thursday that I'll report on at our next meeting. And that's all I have, thanks. Okay, thank you, Councilman. Thank you for sharing that information with us. Uh, I myself, um, well, I didn't, it was an official meeting, but I attended the Youth Commission, along with the Youth Commission um, and the Beautification Committee um, for their community cleanup. It was a joint effort um, this time for the first event of the year on uh, this past Saturday. Um, the Youth Commission is part of the Adoptive Street for Lincoln Way, and they partnered with the Beautification to uh, to take care of all Lincoln Way that day. It was a very good turnout. I think we probably had about 15 people come out and we were able to clean the entire length of Lincoln. Um, it was pretty bad. Um, and so it was well needed. And I wanna thank, personally thank um, our department head, Craig Hoffman for coming out and um, accompanying us all day. It was, it was great to see him out there and I appreciate that, Craig. Um, so that's about all I have. So again, thank you to the Youth Commission and uh, the members of the beautification and everybody who showed up from the citizens that were outside of those two organizations and helped out. So that's all I have. We will now move on to our consent calendar. So we have item F4, I've been pulled by myself. So I will be looking for a motion to approve items one through three. It is recommended that items one through three be enacted simultaneously unless separate discussion and or action is requested. Item one is the minutes of the regular meeting from May 4th, 2021. Item two is to receive and file warrants for period ending May 5th of 2021. And item three is the award of contract for consultant services for wastewater treatment plant optimization. Do I have a motion to move those? Moved. moved by Councilman Lozano. Second. Seconded by Vice Mayor Sandu. We have a roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Sandu. Aye. Council Member Papineau. Aye. Council Member Vandenberg. Aye. Council Member Lozano. Aye. Mayor Farmer. Aye. Those items pass 5-0. So the last item, F4, I pulled this and I, I apologize, Mike. I believe this is your item. Is that correct? Okay. Correct. Uh, I apologize in advance. I, I got busy asking some other things and I and I didn't uh, include these, but I just was only interested in, um, so I see that the six, so we had six six out of seven bidders um, failed to complete. I read through the contract that's asked to be put back and I, unless I just misunderstood, I don't, I'm unclear on what exactly didn't get returned. So my questions would be, let me ask you a couple questions. You can just hit them all at once. One, um, are any of these companies ones we've done business with before? So are they familiar with our bidding process? Number two, um, it says the staff reached out, um, but would, did, the, was a, did the staff reach out to make them aware of that? And were they given a chance to then complete those items and return those so that we didn't have to do the bidding process over? Could, could you help me understand those? Sure, uh, yeah, thanks, Mayor. So with regard to the first question, whether or not they were uh, familiar with our bidding process, and, and we think that that's probably the likelihood of why six of the seven uh, failed to uh, submit the addenda. Uh, so 
maybe just real quick, a little bid 101. Uh, when, when a public agency issues a bid for a project or materials or whatnot, um, you have to go by the public contracting code. And so there's a bunch of paperwork, as you can well imagine, that has to be completed. Typically on, on public contracts, you will have a prime contractor or a prime vendor and for whatever other materials or, or, or subcontracted work that may be included in the bid, uh, they will you know, facilitate uh, any information back and forth between the subcontractor and material supplier. And uh, so in this case here, this wasn't uh, a typical project. We were simply asking for uh, these signs uh, to be, uh, you know, uh, developed and, and delivered uh, for installation. And so these types of vendors who, who basically manufacture the signs, um, they are typically not a, a prime, you know, uh, a bidder, if you will. Typically signs are a part of a road project per se, uh, but that's not the case here. So, so that, that effort is typically facilitated by someone else, a prime contractor. And so that it could well be that because they typically don't do it, that somebody essentially, you know, uh, assists them in that, uh, makes them aware that, oh, there was an addendum issued. And, and basically real quick, an addendum is, is some change in the, uh, in the, the project um, uh, bid package. It can be that there was clarification questions asked by one or more plan holders, uh, you know, for some clarification on something or maybe some specified uh, material or whatnot was, is not available and asking for a substitute or, or equal uh, type of thing. So that's, that's typically what an addendum does, or there might've been some error that uh, the agency had in, in the bid documents. And so it gets corrected. So that's what an addendum does. And anyway, these, uh, these vendors uh, did not acknowledge that we had an addendum. There were some uh, minor uh, clarifications in some of the dimensions on the signs, uh, materials, that kind of thing. And so we put out an addendum for that. And, and only one of them actually acknowledged, there's a form that they have to sign acknowledging that there was an addendum that they checked and that their bid basically uh, is responsive to those corrections, changes, if you will. Uh, so the other six did not. And, and again, in reaching out to them, they were basically uh, indicated that they were not aware that they needed to um, uh, put their, their company's name on the plan holders list. Uh, there's a plan holders list that typically agencies have when you put out a bid package and, uh, and it's for letting whoever may hold the plans know that there was any changes. It could be you know, something even immaterial, maybe the bid date changes or something like that. Uh, that happens at times. So anyway, um, and so they acknowledge that they were not aware that they had to put their name on the plan holders list. And then the other thing is, is they uh, did not acknowledge that um, uh, that there was an addendum that they needed to check for it. Uh, you know, typically any addenda are posted on the agency's website. Uh, so we do what we can to kind of get the information out that there was an addendum, uh, but it does take you know a uh, some responsibility on the plan holder side as well. So my question, is, there was one person, six of them. So clearly there was some. I mean, I get that they maybe not out of their wheelhouse, maybe, or or they're not familiar with the process. But my, my only concern is, and I totally get it, it makes sense. I just, my only concern is that we're going to, you know, spend more staff time, which equals more money, obviously, um, to go back out and redo this process. Um, and two things may result in that. Well, one is there's a cost involved, even if it's, even if it's a few hundred dollars or a few, I, I don't know what that is, but um, when it seems to be that like we could just say, hey, well, hey, there was an addendum. Can you, we'll give you, you know, a time frame to, to bring that back. Um, um, or, or, or that they just are, you know, soured to it and be like, you know, well, we're not going to bid the second time. And then, um, and then we're stuck with somebody like the company who uh, was the one sole um, vendor who did return, which was, you know, more than twice the amount or almost twice the amount. So I would hate to begin that situation where we lose bidders the second time around because we just, you know, somebody didn't dot an I or cross a T. I, I'm just. That's my... Yeah, and, and that's a valid concern. Uh, you can. Uh, what I what's been my experience, and this doesn't happen very often, typically. Uh, but but uh, based on my experience, 
is a lot of times you'll get the same number of bidders and now everybody kind of knows where everybody was at the first time. So the folks who are gonna uh, bid, you know, bid it again. And like I said, most of the time it's the same ones. Uh, they're gonna sharpen their pencil, so to speak. And, uh, you know, if, if they're close kind of thing. Um, but, uh, but essentially that's, you know, that, that, that is a potential that you could have some folks drop out. Um, you know, if they see that they're clearly not competitive, maybe the one who was the highest, um, you know, they may not bid it again kind of thing, so. Okay. Um, and then just the last thing regarding the staff time, if we, we decide to, you know, to, to move with staff recommendation on this and, and put it back out to bid, there was, there was discussion in here in the, in the staff report about uh, working with legal to see if maybe some things need to be changed with it. Um, two things, my concern is, well, to do that would obviously be consenting that we maybe didn't put out the right, I mean, to say that we're going to make a change in the second time around would almost be like, we're, you know, we're admitting some fault about we didn't make, we made it too complicated or something. But the bigger concern is that to consult with legal again is another cost. So it's not just your staff, but then we have to consult with legal and then that's billed. So my concern is how much money are we talking about to go back out? Do we even know? Yeah, I, I mean, I could put a ballpark number on it. Um, I would say probably less than $1,000. And so when you look at a bid like this, you know, you've got a spread of a low bid of 57 to the one responsive bid who was around 115, 116,000. So there's there's roughly, you know, a, uh, what, uh, $60,000 spread there potentially. I, I do get a little nervous when I see kind of an outlying low bid like this uh, being what, 30,000 or so below the next lowest bidder. So uh, they might've missed something or they might've been, you know, specking a, a you know, a, a lower cost material that maybe doesn't meet our, our you know, specifications. So, um, but I think as far as, uh, you know, the consultation with legal, it's, it's really just to make sure that, that we didn't, uh, you know, uh, do something that we could have done, so to speak, uh, to make them more aware. So um, I think that we're, I think that's really a bit of a cursory check. And, and I don't know if Ms. Ms. Steiner may have some thoughts on that too. But um, uh, I, I would say, you know, we're talking probably less than $1,000 in staff time to, to rebid the project. So, and I think for, you know, the potential savings that we could have, uh, you know, I think that there's, there's definitely a, 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 a good uh, bang for the buck, so to speak there. So um, you had an, another comment about, uh, I just wanted to answer your one other comment about as far as could we have them just fill out the forms and resubmit it. And per the public contracting code is my understanding. And, and again, Ms. Steiner may, may uh, be able to provide more detail, but um, that's, that's not allowed. Basically once you know, the bid time uh, uh, comes that uh, we review bids as they were submitted and there's no second chance, if you will, so. Right, if I could, I would think, first of all, I don't think the review of the bids will cost very much money. Um, but also once you open the bids and start looking at the bids, those are the bids you have to deal with. You don't have the ability to go back to people and say, well, could you fix this or something like that? Um, your only alternative once bids are open is either to determine that the low bid is, you know, it, if it was non-responsive, that the reason it was non-responsive wasn't material. Um, and then you run the risk of getting people like suing you because of a problem in your bid process. Um, or just rejecting all the bids or bidding or awarding the bids to the lowest responsible bidder. You can't, you can't go back to people and ask them to fix things that were in their bids. No, it, it makes sense. And, and thank you for clarifying that. And I, and I, and I, and I, I agree. I don't think any of the the council <laughs> wants to go with the third highest bid. And so maybe we'll get cheaper bids. That's, I never thought about the fact that maybe uh, not these bids are public, that you actually get maybe a little more of a fight to, to be to this and we might see actually a saving. So um, anyways, that was my only concerns. Thank you very much, Mike and, and Harriet for clarifying. Does any of the other council have any comments on this item? I do. Mr. Vandenberg, go ahead. I was just curious if, uh, if at all, what efforts are made for local uh, businesses to bid or is it public information and they had their opportunity? Yeah, um, as, as I think you you might be referring to what we uh, sometimes call a local hire preference. Is, is, I just wanted to clarify, is that what you're referring to, Mr. Uh, Councilmember Vandenberg? <laughs> well, not necessarily, but yeah, I mean, I didn't think of that, but 
you could call it that. I was just curious, you know, how and what effort the city puts into getting a local business, you know, involved because it keeps the money in town, in uh, in house, so to speak. Yeah, and and uh, uh, basically, um, to my knowledge, the city of Galt does not have a local hire uh, preference type policy. Uh, typically, those are not allowed. It depends on the funding source. Uh, but if you have any federal or state money, typically, uh, you know that is that is not um, not something that's that's typically allowed. So um, I don't know if Ms. Steiner may have any further uh, comment on this as well. Great. General, generally on um, public works type low bid contracts, uh, you can do outreach, but you cannot give them any kind of preference or anything like that. So you could put something on your website about the bids, you know, that everyone could see, or you could make sure the chamber knows about it if anybody's interested in bidding, but you can't give them any kind of preference um, through the bid process. Um, when you're doing bids for, um, equipment, depending on what your ordinances say, you can have a very small local preference. Um, and if you're interested in that, I suppose um, staff could bring that back and talk to Lorenzo and um, give you more information about that. But that would only be for equipment and supplies. It would not be on a public works contract. So I know in our current municipal code, we have a 5% margin. So let's just say, for example, we had a local company that in a project or, or give us a bid for something, should I say, um, we're allowed to uh, have a 5%, if it's right. but I right. don't know, but, but I, that's, I'd be curious if that was for public works or that doesn't. It's not, that's, that's for equipment and supplies. Um, it's not for public works. Okay. Yeah, th this particular item was for signage and we have, you know, off the top of my head, there's three different sign companies in town. I was just, you know, making sure, I guess that local boys at least had a shot at sharpening their pencils. That's all. Well, absolutely. If, you if you reject the bids and the, and the city goes out to bid again, then any, it's, it's not limited to the people who filed bids this time. Anyone who wants to can file mm -hmm. another bid. Right, right. Um, so local people would have a, a chance at that point, if they so chose to put in a bid, if they felt that they could um, meet the specifications. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Harriet. And and yeah, that would be great if we can encourage um, if any of them want to throw their hat in the mix for that. So uh, any other council members have a comment? Uh, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. President. Comment. Uh, you know, on the on the uh, uh, the report, it say, you know, council could elect to waive the irregularity in the bed sign which could expose the city to bid protest. Means if we doing something, then the other bidder may be protest, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, and then I'm looking at the notice of invitation bid. If you're looking at the letter, the last page, yeah, the city reserve, could you, could you somebody explain to me in the last sen sentence, maybe Harriet? Uh, I'm sorry, can you tell me what the last sentence says? Cause I don't have that open in front of me. Yeah, it says the city reserve the right to award the contract to reject any or all bids to waive non-material and irregularity in any bid or to reject non-conforming, non-responsive, non-responsible. What that mean? Uh, well, that mean, that's exactly what we're talking about tonight. I mean, it's, it's saying that when you go out to bid, you're not obligated to actually award the bid. You can reject the bid, right? That's the first part. So you always have the, even if all the bids were responsive, you still have the right to reject the bid, all the bids. And then you have the right under state law and case law to accept a bid if the error in the bid was not, not material, right? And so the rest of that verbiage really goes to a determination saying that the council has the right um, if it has bids and it believes that there was a non-material type error in the bid to waive that and then to award the bid notwithstanding the error, right? But it has to be non-material. And a lot of times what happens when you do that is, I mean, suppose that the low bid had an error and the second low bidder um, 
didn't make that error, then you invariably draw lawsuits or at least complaints and delay from the second low bidder uh, from, you know, because, because they're challenging whether you should have awarded to the low bid or the second low bid, or in this case, the third low bid, right? And so that's why I think you see in the staff report, the idea that um, because, it, because everyone made the same types of, you know, a, a selection of different types of errors, that, that it's better for the city in staff's opinion, and in my opinion as well, to reject all the bids, start with a clean slate, put, a, you know, put it out to bid again, um, and then and then hopefully have clean bids come in, and that that avoids any problem with one bidder filing a lawsuit against the city because either their bid was rejected or it was you know or that or um, there was a problem and they felt they got the short end of the stick. Thank you, Ms. Hare, to clarification. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, well, we appreciate the clarification and uh, and with that, I would um, look for a motion to approve item F4. Actually, do we have to ask for a public comment? We don't. We yeah, do. Yes, yeah. That's what it. All right, do we have any written comment on that, Tina? Uh, no public comment. All right, any hands raised online, Rose? We currently do not have any hands raised. Right. Thank you. All right, I'll be looking for a motion to adopt a resolution one, rejecting all bids for the wayfinding signage program, and item two, directing staff to re advertise for project bids. Do I have a motion to do so? So mm -hmm. moved. Uh, moved by Councilman Vandenberg, seconded by, was it the Vice Mayor? Yes. Second by Vice Mayor Sandu. Have a roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Sandu? Aye. Councilmember Papineau? Aye. Councilmember Vandenberg? Aye. Councilmember Lozano? Aye. Mayor Farmer? Aye. Motion is approved five to zero. All right, we'll move on to item G. Scheduled matters, notice of public hearing. Do we have any of that this evening? No public hearing. All right. So we'll pass on to item H is our regular calendar. And we'll start with the city manager's office. Item one subject is the Corona COVID-19 update by Mr. Hoffman and Ms. Mendez. So I'm gonna be sharing the screen here for them to go over the COVID update. It's all yours, Amy. Oh, sure. Rose, next slide, if we could. So these are the updated COVID numbers from today. What we're seeing is something that's really flattening out with our increases for Sac County, you know, at 2% uh, with cases as well as 2% for deaths. In Galt, we've really seen um, the amount of cases slow down. And thank goodness, uh, our, our deaths have really been flat for quite some time. So I'm hopeful that we may see some movement next week. I think Amy's going to go into that. But, but uh, you know, we're seeing uh, in order to get to the next tier, we have to be below a, a, a case rate of six. And I believe uh, today we've dropped down to five. Unfortunately, uh, our reporting with the, the state lags a little bit. And Amy, I don't know if you want to touch base on that. Sure. Rose, do you want to switch to the next slide? As Craig mentioned, um, some of the updated numbers that we have for Sac County, we do remain in the red tier. And we have 6.3 new COVID-19 cases per day per 100,000 population. Now, as Craig mentioned, Sac County's numbers um, are more current and they show us at five cases. So we technically do qualify for the orange tier, but the um, California Department of Public Health lags several days. And so our numbers as of today through um, the Department of Public Health are 6.3. So we did not qualify for the orange tier which means that the soonest we would move to orange is going to be June 1st, unfortunately. 
the um, case rate is down from 7.5 on um, May 4th, and our positivity rates dropped as well. So we're at 2.5% positivity rate. The ICU capacity in the greater SAC region also um, is looking better at 31.4% versus 28.4 back um, on our May 4th meeting. On June 15th, um, as we've mentioned in past meetings, the state will fully reopen if vaccine supply is sufficient and hospitalizations are stable, which all kind of point to us reopening on June 15th. Um, the mask guidance will also be updated in accordance with CDC's new guidelines um, on June 15th. The state will not make any changes um, until the June 15th opening for the state. So the mask guidance remains the same. You can switch to the next slide, Rose. Um, we are still um, continuing to administer vaccines at the Galt Market every Wednesday. Um, during the month of May. On May 5th, which was the first vaccination clinic at the market, we had 150 vaccines administered. And last week on May 12th, we administered 115 vaccines. Tomorrow will be the next vaccination clinic um, at the Galt Market. This is a walk-in event. No appointments are needed. And tomorrow, um, I believe the Johnson & Johnson vaccine will be administered. This is in partnership with uh, CSD and Sac County Public Health and South County Services. So um, all of them have been assisting with this. And I believe I just got word of a vaccination clinic happening on Saturday at the Chibola Center. Um, I don't have the exact details on yet on that yet from Parks and Recreation, but we'll push that on on social media as soon as we have that um, kind of shored up with Parks and Rec. Next slide. As of now, 64% of all eligible Californians have received at least one dose of the COVID vaccine. Um, Sac County has administered 1.174 million COVID vaccines. Um, these are the numbers for partial and full vaccinations. As of right now, 34.77% um, of eligible residents in the 95632 zip code have been at least partially vaccinated. And this is up from a couple weeks ago we were at 31.53, so it continues to creep up, although slowly in comparison to the entire county, um, it does continue to rise, so that's a positive note. Next slide. We've highlighted this in past meetings, just the um, best way to access vaccinations. Um, the Vaccinate Sacramento webpage has the most up-to-date clinics, um, vaccine Finder also will provide um, appointments through different local pharmacies, Walmart, Rite Aid, CVS, et cetera. And then the myturn.ca.gov um, website contains all of the mass vaccination sites and the mobile vaccination clinics that are pop-ups that kind of happen throughout the county. So those are um, all kind of open and available in case folks are still looking for locations to be vaccinated. Also, for those who don't have a computer, um, the, the 211, which is in Galt because we have a 209 area code, um, here's the phone number that folks can call to schedule an appointment without having to utilize a computer. Next slide. And that's it, unless there's any questions. I did um, have a meeting last week, Dr. Kasiri was on, and in terms of the continued sort of, you know, we've had this plateau in case numbers and um, we do still have quite a bit of positive um, tests that are occurring. And she did allude to the fact that a lot of that is happening from youth sports because they're doing so much testing at the um, high school level for youth sports. There has been a lot more cases that they've caught through um, that avenue. So that's, part of the issue, I think, that continues um, while school's in session and sports are still going on. So um, June 1st, hopefully we'll see Sac County back into the orange tier and fully opening on um, June 15th with the rest of the state. Happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Um, Amy, could you tell me the 150 
um, doses of vaccine on the first and the 115 on this, the subsequent. Is there any way for us to know how many of those were Galt people? Because I know it's happening at the market grounds and I just, I'm assuming that we're probably getting people that are from out of town at the market that are getting a vaccine while they're there. So is there any way to know how many of those numbers were 95632 and how many were? We don't have that information on hand, but I'm sure it's something we can request from um, the Kasumnas uh, Services District. I know they collect all of that data from folks who come in um, for testing. So we could report on that maybe in two weeks, we can report back with sort of what that breakdown looks like versus um, you know out of county, Sac County, and hopefully we can get down to Galt data. Okay. It's not, I don't wanna have staff spend time on that. It's not that critical to know. I was just, it was just curious um, to know that. My next question before I ask if the council has any questions is, um, we're talking about going into the orange tier. I mean, it. I mean, we're going to open up fully on the fifteenth, pending the vaccination, um, you know, contingency. I mean, does that supersede the tiers? I mean, are are people even paying attention to the tiers if the fifteenth is kind of the end all be all? Hopefully for that, anyways. I mean, are they just going to the tier system going to go away at that point? What's the scoop with that? As far as I understand, the tier system does go away. And there will be certain um, thresholds on capacity still for large event venues and large gatherings. Um, but the space requirements and social distancing um, as it relates to indoor um, restaurants and entertainment type venues, um, arcades and movie theaters, I think that those are going to be loosened. So not sure exactly what those look like and how that plays out but from what i understand and what i've read um everybody is kind of up and operating business as normal i think the only thing they will be monitoring will be indoor concerts there'll probably be um, more restrictions placed on some of those large gatherings of people do we have any thank you amy do we have any um comment from the council on this subject yeah, one quick question, and I apologize for not getting to you before this. We did a 115 and 150 respectively. Um, what ballpark would be our capacity, both with uh, time and um, vaccine supply? You know, actually... I don't have that information. I, I'm not sure. I see Mondo has unmuted. Maybe he has an answer for that. They've been, Parks and Recreation and the Galt Market have been the ones who have been um, kind of rolling this out every week, so. Uh, good evening, Mayor and uh, Council. Uh, yeah, I've been in contact with Dr. Mack and through CSD, he has over 2,000 doses available to him. Um, we're still, they're still not filling those vaccination spots. And there's plenty of spots open. Uh, so anybody who wants to get one can get one, it seems like, uh, in discussions with uh, Dr. Mackey today. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Armando. Any uh, other council members have questions? Councilman Lozano, go ahead. Yeah, I don't have a question about the uh, COVID-19 report. Thank you, Amy and uh, Craig for uh, pinch hitting for the chief and not the chief, but the boss and uh, doing this tonight. Um, I, I would just ask that maybe we pass on to Mr. Hines a request to see if we could have Dr. Mackey come to uh, a future council meeting just to kind of uh, so we all see his face and then also have the ability to to ask him a, a few questions regarding the work that he's doing, uh, not only in our community, but but around. I think that would be very informative and and I'm sure uh, he would be more than willing to do that. So if we could pass that on, I would I would appreciate it. Yeah, I would, I would support that. That's fine with me. Would that be fine with the council if we ask that? I know this is probably not the, well, I guess we can do that here, but would that be okay with everybody? Okay. I'd be fine with that. All right. Thank you, Kevin and Jay. Okay. Um, what, one last question. And again, I only bring this up now as I, I, I feel like it has to do with COVID. Um, I had a conversation with Mr. Hines last week. I know he's not here this evening, so I know it's, you know, we're not going to really get maybe a clear answer, but um, I know there's been a lot of, 
I, I feel that what we're doing with the 4th July celebration um, is centered around the arrangements that we're doing is what I'm speaking of are centered because of restrictions the county has put on us. Um, and so I bring this forward because I know there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of fallout uh, in the community about the charge for the fireworks and the way Mr. Hines explained it to me was because of the, the arrangements that we had to do with Veterans Field and, and the distancing and so on. And, and so I presented to him, well, what if on June 15th, which is obviously two weeks before the fourth, that um, we goes forward as we expect it, um, what, what then changes. And so um, I don't know, I, I know Mr. I know uh, Mr. Solis, you're aware of this. Um, I know your staff has been aware of the chatter in the community on that. Do you, can you please elaborate on that? Is, it, is that why it's, sure. is it, go ahead. So the, what was approved is based on what's going to happen on June 15th. Uh, so that was taken into account when the county approved uh, the actual plans, the plans we had for each one of the events. Like Amy had said earlier, how they're how will they handle large events? And this is how they're going to handle our fireworks. They want people separated. They don't want people uh, close together. So we're working and putting them in pods. Um, that was approved because of what's coming June 15th. You know, not that June 15th, well, things will change and open up even more. Uh, they pretty much assume that and that's what they set in place. We can easily ask again one more time before we start taking any type of payments or anything, um, just to make sure that, that, that they won't just approve, you know, what we did in the past. Right, and, and I understand that, I, understand, I totally get it. Um, my concern is that, if what we're trying to achieve with that is to keep people distance and, and do all the precautions within veterans field. What, what I foresee happening, because I think all of us know this community very well, is that we're going to see a mass congregation of people just on the outside of the field in you know, sidewalks, grass areas around the, you know, the complex and anywhere in that whole vicinity or area, just not abiding by anything. So it's like, almost like what is kind of the point? I feel like we're not, really accomplishing much. I, I know that the charge is is not really, wasn't obviously a guideline of the county. The charge is something that I guess staff or whoever made the final decision um, put to cover, you know, costs associated with making those precautions. But I mean, we haven't charged for fireworks in 33 years and I know we haven't had a pandemic in those past 33 years, but I just, I mean, I would hate for the IDC celebration as a whole such a great event and everybody's really ecstatic about it but it's just this huge negative sh cast of sourness being cast on it because of this and it seems like it's just growing and i that's my only concern i i don't know um councilor vandenberg you had your hand up go ahead yeah you you hit on what i was going to mention is that most of the complaints i saw online were about the cost and i don't see how cost has anything to do with distance you know it's it's Sean hit it right. If you're across the street and you're standing next to someone, you're not going to control that either way. We've never charged for it. I, I really don't see the logic behind it. Does any yeah. other council member have any? I'm sorry, go ahead if you weren't finished. Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe this needs to come back for a vote. Does any other council member have a comment on this particular item? Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, I believe, I don't know this is the right time to ask. I certainly would like to ask, uh, you know, the staff, how they come up with the $20 to that fees and what they expecting to how much revenue they expecting that night. We, we will not recoup the cost that, we'll, that we will encumber to monitor, to place in space, to put out everything, it just, there won't be, we won't make any money. We'll still be losing money. We just won't be losing as much money. And it's not unprecedented to charge for uh, the IDC events. You know, we, we do the fireworks in the pool. It's been very successful. Um, you know, and, and we're, what we're doing is we're recouping costs, not really making money we're recouping costs for what what it costs to do that and how much cost we are cooping 
I believe it was estimated close to $660 in that neighborhood. So I, that's an estimate. I don't have that number directly in front of me. I'm sorry. So I'm, I'm just talking about that, uh, the $20 fees, how much we approximate cooping the cost? Because this is a non-profit or you know, this is the city event. This is event for our citizens. So I, I do understand we don't make money and we, we don't make money from any event for the citizen. Because the money we spend even giving to that's a citizen's money, that's their tax dollars. But I'm talking about how much cooping we uh, approximately cooping their money from that when we giving twenty dollars for each car. I this believe off the top of my head, re looking back, it's about six hundred and sixty dollars is what the estimate was given to me. Can I clarify that question? Twenty. So, how many tickets are we actually allowed to do in that in that area? That I'm sorry, I I don't have that information in front of me i'm sorry i don't know you don't have a ballpark i mean clearly we're limited by capacity and we've you, you've blocked out you know pods or whatever you call no, them. because we're i i don't know how many there is right now and and that just doesn't include um veterans field that also includes the parking lots surrounding the market grounds mike the reason i my line of questioning leads to I, i'm just saying so if we don't know how many tick, it would be useful to know because if if you're saying, well, we have the capacity to do 500 cars, just from throwing a number out there, um, you know, 500 cars, um, say we're going to do that, you know, then basically that's ten thousand dollars. I mean, or is it 200 cars? Because the reason I ask is because I noticed we do have the special event money coming up, which is on our agenda next, and we didn't even give out all of that money. So maybe we could take some of that leftover money and and try to recoup some of that. I don't know. I'm just throwing ideas. I, I know Mr. Hines isn't here tonight and this discussion probably should come to him or when he's here, but I, I for so one. I, yeah. And I, I would say you have, you should, if you wanted to come back, it could come back, but I believe that you're off topic right now. Well, we were talking about something being, being specifically about COVID. Not the, the reason this event. Yeah, but, but whether you're going to charge or not is not specifically about, you know, I understand, I understand that. So, um, if one of the council members or myself, we, we could bring this up in the end of the meeting under council comments, if that's fine. Um, is it a future agenda item? Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. Um, what I would say is I think I can understand what you're getting at and, and we can uh, see if we can get the information and then uh, make that available. Okay. Does anybody have any other comments regarding the COVID-19 update? Okay. All right. Uh, do we have any public comment regarding this item, Tina? No written comment. And Rose, do we have any online comments? No comments online. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman and Ms. Mendez. We will move on to our next item, which is item two, Parks and Recreation, the City of Galt Special Event Sponsorship Application Overview for Fiscal Year 2021 and 2022. Mr. Solis. Hey, Rose, could you please put the presentation up, please? Yes. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, before you tonight, we have the second part of our special event sponsorship. Um, if you go to the next slide. Uh, at the last council meeting, we presented to you these eight events, totaling $5,125 in hard costs, um, should you approve these events. Um, they were presented to you from these groups that were available. Um, they were available to answer any questions for you. And uh, next slide, please. So the recommendation would be to review the special event sponsorship requests for fiscal year 21-22 and provide direction to staff regarding the approval of events, monetary amounts, and or any count contributions. So, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Do we have any Questions from council? Mr. Lozano, go ahead. Yeah, just one real quick question. Um, hold on one second, let me get to. Uh, 
So my question is this, um, and I guess I'm not even really looking for an answer, Armando. It's more of a operational issue. And so I would just raise the issue of this. We have um, eight events. Is that what we have here? Eight. Yeah, I believe that's eight, what I counted. Eight different um, requests for uh, sponsorship, either hard or soft costs uh, from the city, two of which have um, dates identified already. And then there appear to be at least a couple, two or three in there that appear to be like dinners. And uh, it appears at least from the applications that each of the organizations are thinking about around the same time of year. And so I would just uh, not caution, I would, I would just say Armando um, to take a look at uh, trying to get uh, a better date for each of these so that they're not in conflict. And, and I know that sometimes, um, you know, organizations um, are working within their own organization. They may identify a date and, uh, and it may or may not be available because another organization is having a dinner on that night. So there are a lot of TBDs. And, and so I would just, uh, you know, just throw that out there as maybe we could do some proactive outreach to say, hey, you know, by this date, can you guys get us a tentative date so that we can schedule it out? Because I would hate for there to be, you know, a conflict between two organizations that are worthy in our, or in our community uh, that want to do either a fundraiser or a community event and uh, and not be able to work that out uh, way in advance. And I think that we have a responsibility as a city to to do some outreach to them to uh, try to nail that down. So um, that's that's the only comment I have. And again, I, I don't necessarily care how it's done. I just I just saw that as maybe a pitfall in, in the future um, and uh, and thought operationally maybe something to consider if you hadn't already. And that's all I have. Yeah, we, we actually have, we, we have been in contact with them. A, a lot of those uh, TBDs are because of COVID. Uh, you know, they're, they're kind of waiting to plan those to see what the restrictions will be. Obviously, they don't want to have an indoor event when there's still restrictions. So uh, the best thing that we talked about was just to do a TBT. And then we have a process in which they uh, put in an application and uh, we kind of have pencil marked in dates of when we think we can hold them. So yes, we, we do have a process and we will make sure that uh, we reach out again. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just wanna be proactive and maybe even over communicate uh, to the organizations on this so that it works out. Uh, and you know, I fully recognize that last year, many of these organizations weren't able to do uh, some of the fundraising. And so this is gonna be a potentially a big year for them. And I wanna make sure that we on the city end from a policy perspective, um, are able to uh, do what we can to help them, so. Great. Armando, I have a question for you, um, just for clarification. So 7,000 is the budget we set aside currently for the special events and we are gonna be awarding, if, if approved tonight, uh, for all the events totaling $5,125. Is that correct? Does that sound right? The limit is 7,000. There, you'll determine what budget is uh, what number is placed in the budget. Right. Well, we were prepared to give out seven, but we only got fifty one hundred. Just one. All right. Does anybody else have any question on for Mr. Solis or a comment on this particular item? Uh, Mr. Mayor, just a comment. Yes, sir. You know, Your video's off, by the way. I don't know if you're having a problem. But go ahead. Uh, Mr. Mayor, just a comment. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for all the nonprofit organization they ask uh, uh, for the special sponsorship from the city. And as mentioned, uh, Armando, we have seven thousand dollar budget, and uh, they're asking only twenty one twenty five. And I'm happy to support uh, to all the organization whatever they ask. And Armando, that question I asked you offline, did you find out it might be, I'm reading wrong or there's something on that uh, God Sunrise Rotary Club's application? I'm sorry, I did not. I, I barely made it to the meeting. Um, I can and I believe look that up real quick though. Uh, 
you know, if we're looking their application, uh, Galt Sunrise Rotary Club, they, I believe on the application, I don't know, I'm going to look at the application. Let me look at the game. They're asking $1,500 for... So the, the amount that they requested, yes, what sir. some of the people did, again, some of these numbers are estimated numbers. So when a group is asking for a waiver of police services, um, public works to block roads, they don't know what number to put in there and they guesstimate at that number so they can have a, a full application. And so I believe that's what happened at, at this point when they asked for the $1,500. Oh, okay, so that's my be the error. So they're asking only. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. All right. Thank you. That's the clarification I would like to ask. So I'm confused. So their application is for fifteen hundred because in the staff report it says zero. Yeah, that's that's why I was asking that question. The the fifteen hundred is the rental fee, um, the the normal rental fee. So I think that that's what they did is they put that in there, the in kind would be zero is that's a soft cost, not, not, not a hard cost as an officer would be. That's why the number is zero. Gotcha. So no hard cost, soft cost, but no hard cost. Correct. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Does that conclude your questions, Vice Mayor? Yes. Uh, any other council member have anything to add on this? Okay. Well, um, I think they're all going to be great events. I'm looking forward to seeing some stuff happen in town. So I applaud all those events for jumping out there and trying to get um, community things going back, going going again. So um, I will be looking for a, actually, so are we looking for a motion to approve this site? It says review. Review uh, and provide direction to staff. So what you would do is tell us if you want to approve all of them, some of them, none of them, whatever it is that the staff would, uh, the council would like to provide direction to staff to do. Is the money that we don't, if, if we're, does that money roll over from year to year? I know last year it doesn't roll over, right? Typically from year, okay. No, it doesn't. Okay. All right, well, I, I would be in favor of supporting all of them. I don't know, um, does anybody want to? I don't know if we need an official motion. We're just looking for a consensus here. Um, do I have a consensus amongst the council? I'd be happy to support that. Okay, Councilor Vandenberg, Papanel. Okay, all right. It looks like we have a majority consensus. So, Mayor, I'm I'm sorry, Mayor Harriet. Would they not vote on this? And so no, basic basically, what they were, what staff was asking for is if there was. It was really almost a negative. They want to know what to put in the budget. So, so when they bring the budget back and you approve it, you would be approving all of the applications. So there's no need to take any action tonight, except if you want to change something that's in the staff recommendation. Well, it says the approved budget okay. for the community is 7,000. So, I mean, we're not, it doesn't really say that we're approving that number. I'm confused. Mm -hmm. Well, my, my understanding from last week was that what staff is looking for is to put these projects into the budget so that when the budget comes back to you next month, it will they will get approved and then uh, and then the actual events will get approved with them. Well, if that is the case, I would like to hold off on my support of it because I would like to talk to Mr. Hines when he returns and see if we can't get the remaining $1,875 put towards offsetting the cost of the fireworks charge that we're looking at doing, because I think that's if, if something I think we can maybe try to figure out. So I, I would hate to, I would not be in favor of approving this 5125 tonight and not have an opportunity to talk about that other. Uh, Mayor, so, I might, you still have an opportunity to um, redirect that additional money at a later time when the budget comes through the workshop process. Okay. All right, thank you for clarifying that. And have you taken public comment on this item? Not yet, no, we have okay, not. Thank you. Do you wanna see if we have some public comment before we finish this up? Does anybody have any comments from council? Do we have any written public comment on this, Ms. Hubert? Uh, no public comment. Okay, and Rose, do we have any hands raised? No hands raised. Okay. 
So are we looking for a consensus or a vote? Because it doesn't say action. The only action, they would all, you would only need action if there's something that you want to change at this point, because your formal votes will be at the budget time. Okay. Well, we do we have any opposition to what we've just heard? Okay. All right. So I think you got what you need, Mr. Solis. Yeah. Time, is good? Thank you. All right. Okay. We will now move on to our next item I communication. Do we have any communication this evening, Ms. Hubert? Nothing this evening. All right. Item J, city clerk's report. Nothing. Okay. Item K, comments by staff. Mr. Selling. Thank you, Mayor Farmer. Uh, let's start with uh, Ms. Van Stein. I have no updates this evening. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Tyson. I have nothing further to report. Thank you. Uh, how about uh, Chief Small? Yes, thank you, Mr. Sellings. Um, I just have two quick things. Um, last week, May 9th through 15th was uh, National Police Week. So I just want to take the opportunity to publicly thank all of our Galt Police Department officers for their hard work over the past year. Um, and specifically, uh, recognize the sacrifice of Officer Kevin Ton um, since uh, the 15th was National Police Officers Memorial Day. Um, in addition, I also want to recognize the sacrifice of Stockton Police Department Officer uh, Jimmy Lynn, who also recently lost his life in the line of duty. Uh, second, I also want to point out the great work of our two canine teams who competed down in Stanislaus County over the weekend. Uh, they were both very successful, and if you'd like some additional information on that, I'd encourage you to visit our Facebook page uh, where you can see photos of them and also see what awards they won. Great. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Mr. Hoffman. Uh, you know, the one thing that did take place on Saturday, and the mayor identified it, there was a cleanup on Lincoln Way, and I think as we're starting to open up and be able to to have uh, gatherings like that. So typically the beautification committee and youth commission did cleanups on Lincoln Way on the third Saturday of each month. So I think we're gonna try to be doing that in definitely June, July, August, get this going again, and making sure that one of our main streets is getting the, the attention it needs. And we were able to branch out on some of the side streets and. And I think by the time we were done, we had seven bags of trash that we took off that roadway. So I think it makes a big difference. And I know it would have been more, but I think uh, uh, Council Member Vandenberg and, and the mayor were out there a couple weeks beforehand. So they already took a, a lot. So it's good to do the part. And that's it. All right. Thanks. Ms. Mendez. I um, just wanted to let everybody know that the Sacramento Emergency Rental Assistance Program is open again for applications. Um, that is through um, Sacramento County. And so anybody in Sacramento County who's experienced a reduction in household income or other financial hardship due to COVID, um, they are eligible to receive emergency rent and utilities assistance. And so we've started to push that out on social media. I just wanted to make that announcement here so folks are aware that that is um, available. And uh, it's also available to landlords so that they're able to um, fill out at least a portion of the application for their tenants to get the process started. Um, so any landlords out there who have tenants that have back um, rent owed are able to take advantage of the program as well. So. Just wanted to make sure that um, everybody's aware of that. And I think that's all that I have for this evening. All right, thank you. Mr. Solis. Yeah, um, Rose, could you um, put up those flyers for me, please? Yeah, give me one second. 
just wanted to um, let me share my screen here. Right. As we kind of talked about a little bit uh, before, there's some things coming up. Just wanted to make you guys aware of them and um, to kind of advertise them to our, our public. I'm wondering, Rose, if that's what uh, Mr. Solis was looking? No, I need the, the two flyers, Rose. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, my apologies. Let me stop sharing that for one second. We can start with either one, it doesn't matter. Bear with me, I'm sorry. No problem. One more second here. Okay, hold on. Okay. Alrighty, let's start with that there one first. There we go. Just wanted to make uh, citizens aware and um, I, I had sent an email out to uh, the mayor and council uh, starting tonight we're having a uh, grab and go dinners. Uh, on Tuesdays, they'll be located at the Parks and Rec office in our parking lot. Uh, we felt that would be a great place as the pool's starting to open up and people could grab a dinner. Uh, they'll be available there from five to eight on Tuesdays. Rose, could you uh, make that a little smaller or scroll down a little bit? How's that? There we go, thank you. And then tomorrow they'll be out at Community Park. Uh, they'll be uh, offering uh, Tailgater 44 Flavor Fusion and Costas Flying Kettle Corn. Um, we are doing this event to bring out the citizens uh, to provide them uh, things that they could do um, in our parks or while they're in one of our parks. And uh, we're hoping to do this with this company uh, throughout the summer. So um, you have any questions on this event? No. No, okay. All right. Um, Rose, could you uh, go to the next uh, flyer? You can make that a little smaller, that'd be great. There you go. And again, we, we have our 4th of July um, IDC events that are coming up. Wanted people to be prepared that we will have a parade. They've approved our parade, our uh, Kevin Ton 5K run. Uh, there are no restrictions on the parade or the or the run. We'll be having the fireworks, uh, fireworks in the pool. Um, so just uh, you know, mark your calendar, and um, I guess we'll talk more about this topic next council meeting. And does anybody have any questions on this? Uh, Councilman Lozano has a question, go ahead. I, I do real quick. Um, and, and you mentioned fireworks in the pool. Can you explain that to you guys in the community? Yeah, so uh, the they're allowing us to go uh, with 300 people out in the pool. Uh, tickets are sold. Um, you can view the fireworks from the pool area, the fenced area from either in the pool, in the uh, bleachers, uh, in our grass area there. Uh, it's limited amount um, of tickets. Um, we sell them in uh, fours. So I, I believe it's $25 this year for, for a ticket of four people. Um, and then you can do an individual sale and I believe those are $8 each. Okay, and that's and we did that not last year, but the year before. And yeah, we've done it for the last three or four years, I believe it, it, we've been doing that. Not last year, but pre-COVID. Okay, all right. Yeah. And there's no, I mean, other than having access to the pool and stuff like that, there's no other um, benefit other than being in the pool? I mean, well, it, it's a fenced off area. It's limited amount of people. Um, I think it's pretty cool that you can sit on an inner tube um, and watch the fireworks shoot up right above you. 
Um, so. Okay. Thank you. That's all I. That's all I had. Well, does any uh, the other council have a question for Mr. Solis about either of these? No. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Armando. Uh, City so Clerk, Ms. Hewitt. Nothing this evening. Thank you. Okay. Uh, our attorney, Ms. Steiner. Oh, nothing this evening. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Rodacker. I have nothing this evening. Thank you. Okay. Well, at least myself, I got a couple of quick ones. Um, uh, like the chief noted for uh, police officers week last week, <clears throat> this week is uh, public works week. This is the 61st, uh, at least recognized annual uh, public works week. Uh, you know, we've got uh, great staff. I'm proud to represent them. And I uh, just want to, uh, um, you know, make, make it aware, make folks aware, recognize them for their service and dedication uh, and maintaining our various infrastructure that we all rely on every day. Uh, it's through these dedicated uh, folks and their efforts uh, that our nation's transportation, water supply, water treatment, public buildings and other infrastructure are built and maintained. Uh, their contributions in protecting our health and safety as well as our quality of life uh, are very much appreciated. And then uh, the other uh, announcement I wanted to make is we uh, uh, were successful in uh, recruiting for a water conservation officer. We've got Mr. Chad Harper on board now, and he's already started, uh, uh, you know, uh, driving around the city and, uh, and just observing uh, where uh, folks, uh, you know, may have some water running that, that shouldn't be kind of thing or watering on the wrong days. And so he's just, this is an educational effort. It's not, there's no enforcement, no citations, uh, but basically leaving door hangers to uh, remind folks uh, to conserve water. And uh, like I noted, I think a lot of them are uh, just people watering on the wrong days. And, and I think I might get this backwards, hopefully not. But uh, my understanding is I think uh, um, odd addresses are Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, and even addresses are Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays. Um, so I uh, just want to remind folks about that. And uh, that's all I've got for Public Works. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, all right, we will now go to comments and future agenda items for the City Council. We will start with our Vice Mayor, Mr. Sandu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, give me the opportunity. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all the staff doing hard work on all the reports uh, on the agenda item. I also like to thank you for the public comments. Uh, whoever give us a public comment, they just give us a feedback. And personally, I really look at uh, the public comment, uh, it, how it affect on the city. And I also like to thank you for all the nonprofit organization. You know, they're bringing all the event back to the city. And on the agenda item, uh, I like to bring that $20 Agenda item, I would like to ask Mayor if he can talk to the city manager or if you need a consent that $20 to me, you know, this is the first time we're doing uh, uh, last year, we cannot do this uh, uh, for July parade, but I like to, I get a lot of comment too. If there's any way we can, this whatever cost is bring from another budget or we still have a $1,900 from that if we can do it. And I like to ask the consent for Mayor Felix uh, from the council, uh, for you are feeling co very comfortable to talk to the city manager, that's the agenda item I would like to resolve or bring it to the city council. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, sir. Um, just to let you know, I when I did have a conversation about this with Mr. Hines uh, before he left town. He did make mention that as of June 15th, we could possibly reevaluate the cost um, if it was allowed. So I think, so I did have a conversation with him, but is there, would there be a consensus for me to go to back to him on behalf of the council to ask him about revisiting this? I'm seeing yeah. heads nodded from Mr. Lozano and I, I, I nod my head only because um, if we're going to talk about the $20 fee in veterans field, I'd also like to have it in the discussion, uh, the um, fireworks in the pool as well, because I think it's the same thing. Okay. Okay. 
All right. So if, if I'm understanding correctly, I will uh, approach Mr. Mr. Hines on this, and if need be, uh, we will bring it back for a future item. But I will um, consult with him uh, before that, as soon as he's back in town. So, um, is that all you had, Mr. Vice Mayor? Yes. Okay. Thank you, uh, Council Member Papanow. Uh, Chief Small mentioned the uh, Stockton police officer funerals tomorrow. It's at 11 o'clock. We're not allowed to go due to the COVID restrictions, but uh, it'll be uh, broadcast on their website and I'm sure many of the uh, news stations should you choose to join me in uh, watching it. And that's all I have. All right, thank you, sir. Councilman Vandenberg. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I would echo those sentiments. It seems to be happening more frequently and it's, it's a bit concerning. If, very concerning, really. Uh, I'd like to thank the staff for their hard work and, uh, and uh, look forward to, or I should say, I, I do appreciate uh, public works. It's a lot of times you hear complaints about the very few things that break, but more often than not, everything works seamlessly and it, it's, a, it's a good thing to note. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Councilman Lozano. Yeah, I, um, I also want to uh, thank all the uh, public works folks out there this week uh, and all the time, but, uh, but since it's uh, public works week, appreciate your uh, service. Also like to recognize the Galt uh, Police Department, the officers, dispatchers, and other civilian staff uh, as we just passed uh, Police Memorial Week um, and certainly uh, honor uh, the life of Officer Ton, uh, one of our own. Uh, so I appreciate uh, all the support the community gave uh, last week. I saw blue ribbons uh, in the community as I as I went around, and and lots of people thanking thanking uh, officers for for their support and their their duty. Um, I just want to bring back and maybe um, you know I talked about maybe bringing Dr. Mackey in. Um, uh, you know I, I think maybe I take it one step further and and see if we could. Uh, provide him with a uh, proclamation or something, uh, ask, thanking him uh, for his work. Um, he truly was the driving force behind getting um, our seniors vaccinated through a mobile system. Um, he, he went above and beyond to, to accommodate. And so, uh, so, you know, to see him uh, come here and provide us with just a little uh, brief presentation, maybe about what he's doing, what he's done, and then us providing him that, I would throw that out there. Again, it doesn't have to be next meeting, but um, uh, Mr. Mayor, if you could speak with the, the city manager about it, and I certainly will in my uh, biweekly one-on-one, -on -one, so. Uh, sure, yeah. if you wanna pass on, um, either speak to him in person or even email him, and then I will follow up with him and- Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, like I said, I think Dr. Mackey's done an awesome job and and really uh, statewide uh, taking the lead for somebody in his position uh, at the county level to really uh, to really push this stuff out to to folks that uh, that uh, really had a desire to to be vaccinated. So um, so uh, that that's all I have. I appreciate uh, uh, also the public comment, uh, and uh, certainly want to thank the staff for their their hard work the last uh, uh, honestly about last year and a half uh, since we've had this um, pandemic. So thank you. All right, thank you, Councilman. Um, I would just like to um, first thank the PD for their continued traffic enforcement. I saw the radar trailer out today and and uh, I, I appreciate that continued efforts. Um, I wanna congratulate our canines for their, for their uh, performances, uh, Kane and Copper and uh, Slater and Officer Little, I believe. Um, so congratulations to them. And um, again, want to um, thank the, uh, I want to thank actually Public Works and Parks and Rec for um, starting to get a handle on the weed control and things in town. I'm starting to see a huge difference on some of the areas that I pointed out and it makes a huge, huge um, perception on the public. And uh, when we were out doing our cleanup, um, I noticed it right off. So I thank you for your quick action on that. And uh, getting getting a jump on that. I know we've had some some internal staff struggles with that. So thank you, um, and uh, thank you to again to the Youth Commission on Beautification. Uh, thanks again to Craig for coming out. Um, and with that, I just want to leave one last thought regarding that. And I, 
you know, one thing we notice on these cleanups is we always notice that the biggest problems tend to be the public areas, um, the business, sometimes in the, in the, in the malls, um, out in front of businesses and, and around businesses. And, and it's not so much in the residential areas and it's on the streetscapes and the meetings. And I just, you know, people just, I say, you know, people wouldn't just open their door and throw garbage out in their own driveway, but they seem to just have a habit of just driving on the road and just doing that or coming out of a, uh, a restaurant, just chucking something down on the ground. I mean, we all live in this community. It's something we all have in common, no matter if we live on the east side or the west side or whatever. I, I just, I, I applaud the people that come out and help keep things clean. But at the same time, it upsets me to see the level. I've already seen trash in the middle of Lincoln Way and we just cleaned it Saturday. I've already seen stuff, probably 10 or 15 items, just in you know, like a quarter mile stretch. I just would ask the public, if you please be, be more cognizant of that and, and talk to your if you're a business owner, please do your part. Set an example for your fellow business owners um, to keep things looking nice. If you are a citizen, set an example to your neighbor, talk to your neighbors, talk to your people in the community about doing this because no one wants Galt to look like some of the other cities that I've seen lately. And we, we have to pull together. We cannot rely on the city to do this alone. We cannot rely on the beautification community to do this alone and, and people adopting streets. This has to start with us and all of us. So please be cognizant of that and lead by example. So. With that, I think that's all I have for this evening. So um, without further ado, we will adjourn the meeting, 7.51 p.m. Everybody have a good night. Thank you. Good night.